All were crowding around M. Bermutier, the judge, who was giving his opinion about the St. Cloud mystery. For a month, this inexplicable crime had been the talk, from Manhattan to the Hamptons. Nobody could make head or tail of it. M. Bermutier, standing with his back to the fireplace, was talking, citing the evidence, discussing the various theories, but arriving at no conclusion. Some women had risen in order to get nearer to him, and were standing with their eyes fastened on the clean-shaven face of the judge, who was saying such weighty things. They were shaking and trembling, moved by fear and curiosity, and by the eager and insatiable desire for the horrible, which haunts the soul of every woman. One of them, Lucy, paler than the others, said during a pause, It's terrible. It verges on the supernatural. The truth will never be known. The judge, a British expat worth more money than a single borough for his affiliations with the questionable sort, turned to her. True, madam. It is likely that the actual facts will never be discovered. As for the word supernatural, which you have just used, it has nothing to do with the matter. We are in the presence of a very cleverly conceived and executed crime, so well enshrouded in mystery that we cannot disentangle it from the involved circumstances which surround it. But once I had to take charge of an affair in which the uncanny seemed to play a part. In fact, the case became so confused that it had to be given up. Several women exclaimed at once, Oh, tell us about it. Do not think, however, that I, for one minute, ascribe to anything in the case to supernatural influences. I believe only in normal causes. But if, instead of using the word supernatural to express what we do not understand, we were simply to make use of the word inexplicable, it would be much better. At any rate, in the affair of which I am about to tell you, it is especially the surrounding preliminary circumstances which impressed me. Here are the facts. I was, at that time, a judge at Ajaccio, a little white city on the edge of a bay which is surrounded by high mountains. The majority of the cases which came up before me concern vendettas. There are some that are superb, dramatic, ferocious, heroic. We find there are the most beautiful causes for revenge which one could dream. Enmities hundreds of years old, quieted for a time but never extinguished. Abominable stratagems, murders becoming massacres, and almost deeds of glory. For two years I heard of nothing but the price of blood, of this terrible Corsian prejudice which compels revenge for insults meted out to the offending person. I had seen old men, children, cousins murdered. My head was full of these stories. One day I learned that an Englishman had just hired a little villa at the end of the bay for several years. He had brought with him a French servant, whom he had engaged on the way at Marseille. Soon this peculiar person, living alone, only going out to hunt and fish, aroused a widespread interest. He never spoke to anyone, never went to the town, and every morning he would practice for an hour or so with his revolver and rifle. Legends were built up around him. It was said that he was some high personage, fleeing from his fatherland for political reasons. Then it was affirmed that he was in hiding after having committed some abominable crime. Some particularly horrible circumstances were even mentioned. In my judicial position, I thought it necessary to give some information about this man, but it was impossible to learn anything. He called himself John Rowell, but he need not care to explain. His vast fortune and the companies under it were always documented weekly in the periodicals of the city. I therefore had to be satisfied with watching him as closely as I could, but I could see nothing suspicious about his actions. 